Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending my webinar today entitled Understanding Teacher Licensure Exams. Um, I look forward to a very interactive session today. So it will not just be me talking uh, throughout the webinar. There'll be several opportunities for you to participate and to give your input. And the biggest thing is for you to have an active takeaway uh, from our session today that you can immediately apply in your programs or with students that you're mentoring to help improve uh, their chances of passing their licensure exams this semester. So let's go ahead and get started. In this session, we're going to cover licensure and certification exams, just an overview. We're gonna talk about some challenges and barriers that some of our students have been facing or continue to face. Uh, I'll give you a few points to ponder. and We'll talk about that actively during our session. We'll take a closer look at the exams, um, how to prepare both our faculty and our students for success on the exams. And we will um, follow up with a brief Q&A session and a wrap up session towards the end. Okay, let's talk about licensure exams. Uh, licensure exams serve a variety of purposes, although majority of our institutions use them as either a capstone, uh, meaning that that is the final project that our education majors will complete, uh, in addition to student teaching to say that they are qualified for graduation and qualified to enter the field of teacher education. Um, some schools also use these as gateway exams where one portion of the exam is utilized to gain access to your upper level education courses or upper level music courses. And the other exam is used as a closing gateway to kind of get out of your program or to be qualified to student teach or to graduate. So it's a variety of ways that our institutions and our state departments utilize the certification exams for our students, either as a capstone or a gateway exam. Uh, provisional or temporary licensed educators, um, a lot of the times, you know, they come from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, some of them are those who may have changed their major along the way. Uh, they may have started out as an education major, specifically a music education major, and due to various challenges they face either with the exam or some of their coursework, they may have redirected and chosen either the performance track general music track or an individualized studies track to graduate from school, but they still had a desire to teach and they would receive a provisional or a temporary license to teach for one to three years while they satisfy education course requirements and the certification exam requirements. And of course, um, the exam companies that are running these exams today, we have two major companies in the US. Um, they are the ones who kind of produce and put together these exams and market them out for our institutions and our students. They are the Educational Testing Service, which is the most popular, and the Pearson Company. Let's talk about a couple of challenges and barriers. Um, for those of you who are familiar with my work and my research over the past couple of years, I do a lot of work with teacher candidates and provisionally licensed teachers or teachers who've been out of school for a while who are um, struggling to pass the praxis exams or the GACE exams. And of course, the recurring themes are the challenges and barriers that they face either during their undergraduate program or that they face as they try to prepare for these exams. Uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that I've heard frequently is communication. Uh, many of our current students um, and those who recently graduated um, face challenges with when and what was communicated about uh, licensure exams. Uh, in my research study for my dissertation, many indicated that they felt blindsided, that they did not know that they needed to take these licensure exams, let alone two of these exams, before their junior year. Um, a lot of them felt that they were put, placed on a rush schedule to try to pass these exams to either be qualified to student teach or to uh, qualify for commencement. Also, the frequency of communication. In the rare instance that I did have people who had heard about the practice exams maybe freshman year, it wasn't often that these things were communicated to the student. And when it was, it was just in casual conversation, not necessarily a directed conversation. Well, this is what the exam is. This is the purpose for the exam. And this is when we suggest you take the exam. So communication has been a recurring theme as to uh, students' preparation and ultimately their success on their exams, whether or not they have one attempt to pass or whether they've been trying for several attempts to pass the exam, just not having all the information they felt was a barrier to their success. 
Another barrier that um, was common in my research study was the content on the exam. They felt that a lot of what was assessed on the exam was not offered to them during their undergraduate studies as a part of the curriculum or the courses that they took, or that a lot of the information when it was discussed, it was very vague. So for example, um, intro to music technology and understanding things about microphones or uh, the MIDI system or DAW or things like that, or understanding how to properly analyze the score, they felt in some instances, depending on what time period it was, that they felt rushed through that content or that the professor that they had had not covered the content at all, either because of time or just because of comfortability with the topic themselves. Um, another was course and lesson availability, whether or not the courses were even offered in the program. I know when I was an undergrad as a music education major, I did not take any music technology courses because I was not a mass comm or mass media major. So just having access to, access to those courses that are necessary for success on the exam may not always be in our students' view or in their curriculum plan. And of course, content with exam preparation resources. For those of you who, you know, have been in school maybe 10, 15 years ago, and you're familiar with the Praxis One labs or the Plato labs or just the student success labs that they have for the Praxis Core basic skills exam, we noticed that there were not many resources available for the subject area assessments, such as Praxis Two or the gay subject area assessments. So having access to this content, a lot of uh, my clients and people that I've talk to have felt that this served as a barrier or a challenge to their um, level of preparedness and their ultimate success on these exams. And of course, finally, this is an area that, you know, we always want to say, well, I didn't learn this in class, I didn't do this, but we also have to account for student preparedness as well. And one of the challenges and barriers that I see even work with the clients that I have now is prior knowledge and deficiencies. A lot of our students enter our programs with severe deficiencies, um, sometimes at no fault of their own, either they've been in high school programs that had a revolving door of um, conductors and directors, or they, they were in programs that were heavily focused on the performance aspect of um, ensemble work and not so much on the theory and content aspect. So they came in with limited prior content knowledge about music terminology, about the parts of their instrument, about how to transpose for their instrument. Um, and so that kind of put them behind the um, ball before they even began their undergraduate study. Also, the inability to connect content between classes has served as a huge barrier for our students. Being able to connect the themes and the concepts that are learned in music history courses and connecting that to what we learn in theory, oral skills, instrument of vocal pedagogy classes, that has been a huge barrier with students not being able to make connection as to why the content they learn at this level freshman year needs to cycle back around and guide their understanding junior year. Um, additionally, just connecting content and deficiencies in core classes, um, just not taking the core classes seriously, especially English composition and math, not knowing that you're going to need those skills and content that you would grasp in those courses to pass the practice core, to be able to write a uh, you know, a holistic statement when you're answering your constructive response questions. So these are some things that um, I feel, you know, we need to address as faculty and as advisors and kind of start to shed light and figure out ways that we can get our students to pass um, and to excel beyond these deficiencies. Uh, one thing we often don't talk about on the university level is learning disabilities. Um, a student may have had dyslexia in the K-12 um, setting. They may have had um, ADHD or other learning disabilities. And we often don't have that conversation or don't take that into consideration when those students come to college. And I'm, I always say that just because they're in college does not mean that this, that disability went away. So it's very important that we take the time to really look at whether or not the learning disability poses a challenge or a barrier, not only to understanding the content in class, but being able to understand and comprehend the content, the sentence structure, the question structure, the way the answers are formulated, the terminology that we see on these licensure exams. And finally, of course, something that we kind of chalk off to a student being lazy and we're not really taking into consideration that the student might actually have test or performance anxiety. They know the content, 
They do very well when they're speaking the content in class, but whenever we give them an exam in our class or when they go to take a standardized test such as the practice, they freeze up or they forget everything that they've learned. So it's important that we take a look at the barriers and challenges that we see in these three boxes and that we really start to have some courageous conversations with our faculty and start to have um, a welcoming environment and an open environment for our students to be open and honest and feel comfortable sharing their concerns with you about the barriers they feel they're facing or that they perceive they're facing when it comes to preparing for standardized assessments. So definitely um, challenges and barriers are something we have to discuss and address before we can talk about building a study plan and preparing for the praxis case or other teacher licensure exams. Let's talk about a few points to ponder and feel free to uh, drop your answers down in the chat box, whether you're here with me on Zoom or you're listening in on Facebook. Um, I would encourage you to just write down a few things as we go so, so that you can continue to think about these after the session. But think about your current institution, your current department. Have you or your faculty members taken this exam or taken these exams? If you have, have, have you taken them recently? The test has changed so much. Each of these tests have changed so much from the weight for each category, from how much music history and theory is worth, to how much technology is worth, to how the questions are structured, to um, the number of questions on the exam. How many questions do we have for listening versus how many questions do we have for selective response or multiple choice? So have you taken this exam? If so, have you taken it recently? And if, if you did, what did you discover about this exam that would be beneficial to your department or beneficial to your students. If you have not taken these exams, I'm gonna be courageous and ask, why not? I feel that we can only be a better benefit to our students if we know what's on the exam ourselves. We can't help someone if we don't know what we're going to begin with. So I feel it's extremely important that if we as faculty members have not taken or looking at this, looked at this exam, passed a study companion, that we make an earnest effort this year to register and take the exam for ourselves, just to see what's on the exam, to see how the pacing of the exam is, to see what the sentence structure, the question content is, and to kind of identify what challenges our students may be facing or identify what gaps we may have in our curriculum. Next question. What type of resources does your department currently have to assist students with exam preparation? Do you offer a listening lab? Do you offer a prep course, whether it's a zero credit course or a seminar course? Do you offer tutoring sessions or study cohorts to help those who are in line to take this exam prepare? Do you have peer tutoring services? Do you have faculty members who are dedicated towards researching and studying these licensure exams and helping to provide uh, written resources or electronic resources for your students? Next question. Does your school offer fee waivers for the music teacher licensure exam? I know this may seem minimal, but this exam is very expensive. Um, and if it's my understanding, they have went up $10 this year. So while it used to be $140 to register for this exam, I believe it is now $150. So imagine if someone has taken this exam three or four times in a year, they're paying an upwards of almost $600 for this exam. And if they're barely making it, or if they're struggling in other areas, this can become a huge burden on them financially. So a fee waiver may be something to consider to kind of alleviate this added stress in our students because the stress of the exam is enough, but the stress of being able to afford the exam, that kind of exacerbates the problem. And next question, how do you or your faculty transfer knowledge and content in your classes to your students? So are you strictly lecture style? Do you do note taking mostly through the class period? Do you utilize technology? Are you utilizing the devices that they would normally see on their exam? Are you incorporating some of the differentiated styles of teaching and learning so that all students can grasp the concepts? And how do you connect the content to, um, to what is assessed on the licensure exams? Have you looked at the breakdown for the exam and aligned that or look to see if it is aligned with your course syllabi, with your course outline? And if not, 
maybe think about some ways. We're not saying to teach to the test, but we want to at least be teaching things that are relevant to the content being assessed on the exam. So these are just a few points to ponder. And of course, um, everyone who's listening in or participating on this call will receive a full copy of this presentation so that you can share these pondering questions with your faculty and your colleagues. And you can even share them with your students because you'd be surprised from their perspective if they feel you're providing these services for them or if they feel they need more from you and your department. Let's take a closer look at the exams. And just to give a preference, I'm going to be extensive about the Praxis exam and I'll give an overview of the GACE exam. But as far as the other state exams, I will just give the names and titles. But if you would like more information about those state exams, because there are so many, just let me know. I'll provide my contact information after this session and I'll be happy to give you more information about any of the exams that I do not go in detail about today. The Praxis Series Assessments, they are the most common assessments used across the country and in some areas abroad. They are administered by the Educational Testing Service and they, um, they consist of two major assessments. The General Skills Test, which is called the Praxis Core. It was formerly the Praxis One many years ago, but it stands for Praxis Core Academic Skills for Educators. And that basically assesses your knowledge of reading, writing, and math. Um, and then a subject area test, we have several now. Um, we have the PLT, which is Principles of Learning and Teaching, Praxis 5113, Music Content Knowledge, Praxis 5114, Music Content and Instruction, Praxis 5115, Instrumental and General Knowledge, and Praxis 5116, Vocal and General Knowledge. So let's take a look at each of these in detail. The Praxis Core exam consists of three sections. I've given you the name of the section and their actual testing um, ID number. The minimum passing scores, it says C-Link provided. I'm going to provide you with uh, the scores towards the end and I'm gonna send you a PDF copy of the minimum passing scores for every state in the country. Um, there are some exemptions for the Praxis, but it, is, it varies by state. Uh, for some states, they will indicate that if you have a specific score in the SAT or the ACT, that you do not have to take the Praxis Core exam. Similarly, few states, not many, will also give an exemption for those who have attempted the GRE. Um, so definitely um, check with your state education department or check with your institution's education department because they can tell you what the latest legislation is in your state about whether or not students are exempt based on their SAT or ACT scores and what those minimum requirements are. Um, score reporting uh, for your reading and your math, you will get your scores immediately after the student takes the exam. These um, exams are now computer based. And as soon as they're done the exam and they click submit, they will see their score pop up on the screen. They will also see a breakdown of how they did in each category of the exam, how many questions they got right out of how many questions were available to answer. The writing portion, however, has to be scored by a panelist. So it usually takes about uh, three to four weeks for those scores to come back. But reading and math, students will usually know the same day if they have passed those components or not. You can take these components either individually or you can take them combined in one sitting. If you take it in one sitting, it takes roughly about four hours or a little bit more than four hours to complete the exam. Each exam by itself is maybe about an hour and a half. The suggested timeline, I've always advocated that the Praxis Core is a graduated form of the SAT. So I would even encourage um, departments and schools to maybe consider using this in lieu of a placement exam in reading and math. I would consider using a Praxis Core exam if they're planning to be an education major as an entrance exam. Or I would suggest that students are able to take this after their freshman year when they've completed their English courses and their college math courses. They should be equipped to take and pass this exam by the end of freshman year. A student should not be a junior just attempting to practice core for the first time. 
The next test is a practice PLT, which stands for Principles of Learning and Teaching. There are a few states that require this exam, not many, um, but uh, some of them give you an option that as long as you take one of the five tests that are available then and pass it, then you meet the qualifications. Whereas a few other states, they specify which PLT they want you to take. So it's very important to definitely check your state handbook. And again, I have a, a sheet that I will give you that lists all the passing scores, which states require which exams so that you can take a look at that. Um, but five tests are available. You can take it for the early childhood level, either the K-6 level, grades five through nine, grades seven through 12, and new recently, pre-K through 12. I found that many of those who are majoring in music, especially planning to teach secondary music, have opted to take the seven through 12 test whenever they had the test. So that may be something for you to discuss with your students as to which one they feel comfortable with, um, seeing that they meet the state requirement, of course. Um, there are some states, like I said, that require a PLT exam, and I will bring that document up um, after this presentation. Um, the minimum passing scores will be listed as well. And the suggested timeline for this exam, because it is heavy, um, co heavily concentrated on uh, educational techniques, um, you can probably successfully take this maybe um, beginning junior year, end of sophomore year. You will want to have taken intro to, intro to education, intro to music education and reading in the content area or intro to um, psychology before you take this exam. Because this exam asks questions about learning theories such as um, Piaget, um, Bandura. They ask about um, classroom management techniques. They ask about lesson plan techniques. So you would need the content that in those courses in order to be successful on this exam. So many of our students would have taken the necessary courses to pass this exam at least by the end of the first semester junior year, if not the end of sophomore year. So you can kind of gauge that based on your curriculum outline as to when students would have finished enough of those courses to pass this exam. But they definitely need to have their psychology class completed, intro to education, intro to music education, um, and possibly reading in the content area before they take this exam. Praxis 5113, music content knowledge, is the most common and longest running music subject area exam. It is completely multiple choice or the new term, of course, is select a response. It contains a listening section at the beginning. And from my experience, um, I take this test every year just to stay current on, um, tech, on what's happening on the test. So I've taken these tests over 50 times in probably the past 20 some years. But um, it, the listening section varies. Sometimes you'll have 21 questions, sometimes you have 25 questions in listening, and then the remainder of the test is uh, straight multiple choice guided by yourself. The first, the listening section is um, guided by the online proctor as you're taking the exam. You still wanna pace yourself because the time does not start over when you finish that section. Once you finish that section, it's important to let your students know they cannot go back to answer any of the listening questions once they have um, finished section one. They can go back to any questions that they did not answer in section two, which is just a straight multiple choice section, but they cannot return to the listening portion once, that, once they click past that portion. So that's something important to communicate with your students because many students do not know that when they take the exam. Um, if a student struggles on a question um, and it's a straight multiple choice question, they can mark the question and come back to it at the end. Uh, it is very important to pace yourself on this type of exam because it has almost 120 questions on it. So I always say you want to spend no more than about 38 seconds on a question. Um, you don't want to sit here spending one, two minutes on a question because it tends to drag your time down. If you find that you're spending that long, mark the question and move on. OK, I always I also encourage students to uh, read the answer choices first, then read the question, then go back and read the answer choices again. It helps to get all the clutter out of your head when you're trying to answer these questions, especially if you have test anxiety. But it also helps you to put the question in a better context to understand what it's really asking you. So read the answers first, then read the question, then go back and read the answers again and, and, and answer the questions accordingly. There are four main sections to this exam, and you can see the percentages. Music history and literature is worth 15% of your overall score. 
contains some listening questions and general multiple choice. Theory and composition is 16%, some listening questions there. Uh, performance is worth 22%, and pedagogy, professional issues, and technology is the largest portion of the exam worth 47%. That is a huge shift from when I passed this exam back in 2004. Um, Music history and literature used to be worth 47% um, back then. So there's been a huge shift and you can see where the focus in education is today is on professional issues and technology. That's your classroom management, that's your copyright laws and fair use policy, that is your um, special education understanding, your learning theories, and of course, anything dealing with technology, whether it's software or whether it's music editing. Minimum passing scores, again, I'll share that with you. The suggested timeline for the Praxis uh, 5013, I would say as soon as your students finish their last music history course and they finish up to um, 20th century theory. Okay, so that's probably roughly around uh, first semester junior year for most of our students. Um, but it's important to have the conversation with them freshman year so that they know that this exam is coming. Don't wait until junior year to tell them about the exam, but have the conversation all the way. And they should be able to take this by the end of their first semester junior year. Praxis 5114. Music content and instruction, there are roughly about nine states or so that require this exam, and all of their passing scores are around the same, around 162. Um, the, again, multiple choice, select the response questions, but this exam is only different from 5113 because it has three essay questions or constructive response questions at the end. The content on this exam and the content on 5113 are essentially the same. It's just the percentages are a little bit more balanced here and it has those essay questions at the end. You still have a listening section at the beginning, but the titles for your categories are a little bit different. You have music, and his music history and theory grouped together, performances in a category by itself, you have instruction, professional issues, and technology. And then the last component is instructional activities, which are those three constructive response questions. Now, it varies which questions you get, but typically in the past, or what I've seen as a pattern, I believe, is that they'll ask you one constructive res um, response question based on general music knowledge. The other one will be based on vocal. And the, other, and the third question will be based on instrumental music. So it's a nice mixture of the three. However, you could get two general music questions and an instrumental question. Just because you're a vocal major does not mean you're gonna get a vocal question and vice versa. Just because you're an instrumental major does not mean you're gonna get strictly instrumental questions. So our students have to study comprehensively for both 5113 and 5114. Same timeline I suggest end of uh, first semester junior year for taking this exam. Uh, we have two new exams that just rolled out this summer, Praxis 5115, in an effort to hear the cries that our exams have been too broad, um, they rolled out one instrumental and general knowledge and another that you'll see in a moment, vocal and general knowledge. However, only six states have adopted this exam to this date. And so we're hoping that more will adopt it later, but right now only six. Um, multiple choice all the way through and select the response, no constructive response questions. And you can see the um, percentages for each of the categories here with the largest category being pedagogy and instructional practices. So that's a huge area on the exam. Technology here is only worth 13% as opposed to the 47% on 5113. The suggested timeline, same timeline, end of the first semester of junior year. And 5116 is the vocal and general knowledge exam. Same balances for the categories, it's just a different title for the test. So of course this test focuses more on vocal pedagogy, whereas a 5115 test, you'll have more instrumental pedagogy. That is going to serve probably as a relief for some students who've been struggling taking the comprehensive exam, but the challenge right now is that they may be in a state that does not offer the exam. I do have one client who is getting ready to test out the 5115 exam in a couple of months. So we will see how it goes. I will be taking both of these exams um, within the next couple of weeks. So I can stay current as to what's on these new exams as well. So I'll be happy you know, to share some insight with you uh, once I take those exams. 
The GACE exam is popular in Georgia. Um, that is the only state that hosts this dance for Georgia assessments for the certification of educators. Um, same structure as the Praxis. This one is also run by the Educational Testing Service, um, basic skills tests and reading, writing, math, but their music subject tests they've broken it into test one and test two, or you can take the combined test where you take both sections together in one day. If you do that, expect to be in the testing center for about five to five and a half hours if you take both tests on the same day. So I would not recommend taking both sections on the same day unless you are just a glutton for punishment or you don't have anything else on your schedule for that particular day. Test one uh, has the following sub areas, oral skills and analysis, composition and improvisation, history and repertory, history and literature, and performance competencies for educators. So that's your instructional practices or your, I'm sorry, your pedagogy uh, performance practices. The minimum scores are a little bit different in Georgia. Um, if you get a 220, they consider that to be passing at the induction level, but of course to be highly qualified, so to say, they encourage you to try to pass it with a 250 or higher on the exam. Test two, um, is multiple choice only. This one does not contain a listening section. This focuses on technology, teaching competencies, and professional knowledge and synthesis. So again, same passing score requirements, 220 to pass at the induction level or the basic level, and 250 to be considered uh, professional in, in, that, in that particular field. Other state exams that we have, I'll just go through just the titles. Um, in Arizona, you have the Arizona Educator Exam and the National Evaluation Series. California is the CSET. Florida is the FTCE. Illinois, the Illinois Licensure Testing System. Indiana, the Indiana Core Assessments. And of course, you see here, they've broken them into three areas. So you either take the general music assessment, the vocal assessment, or the instrumental assessment. Massachusetts, MTEL, Michigan, the MTTC, Minnesota teacher licensure exams, and again, either instrumental music or vocal music, Missouri educator gateway assessments, the NYSTCE exams, the Ohio assessments for educators, the Oklahoma subject area test. And again, they've kind of broken theirs down as we saw with the 5115 and 5116. Oregon Educator License Assessments, Texas Examination of Educator Standards. Many of you have heard about Texas for a while. That's one of the popular um, other state exams that are out there. If you heard of Praxis, Gates, and Texas, that just seems to always be in the forefront. And of course, Washington, you have the West E and you have the NES. So if you're a choral or instrumental major, you'll take the Washington Educator Skills Test. But if you're trying to teach general music or elementary music, you take the NES exam. I mentioned these other state exams because it's important for us to remember as college faculty that a lot of our students may be from out of state in our institutions and they may not want to stay in the state where they're studying when they go to um, begin their career. So it's important to have a working knowledge of all of these state exams because you want to make sure you give the best information to your students to best equip them for success in their field. We have to realize that not all of our students are from Virginia or from Nevada or from Arizona. We want to make sure they have all the knowledge at their fingertips so that they can make a wise decision for themselves professionally personally. So it's important to have a working knowledge of what every state requires. Preparing our faculty and students. And again, as I'm talking, if you have any questions, feel free to place them in the chat, either on Facebook or here on Zoom. A few tips for faculty. I encourage you to familiarize yourself with these exams. Read the study companions. I will give you links to the website so that you can download these study companions. I encourage you to take these exams. I encourage you to um, start a study cohort to engage a regular discussion in your faculty meetings or with uh, other professors who teach the same subject as you. For those of us in large departments where there may be more than one music history professor, I encourage you all to sit down, get a copy of the study companion. 
get a copy of the practice test and go through it and, and discuss you know, what's on the exam and how it aligns to your curriculum and what challenges you feel your students may face with the questions that are on that exam. Communicate with your music majors during freshman orientation and often throughout their matriculation. When they come in to schedule their classes, as soon as they indicate they want to be an education major, there should be a meeting held during that orientation session to let them know everything they are to expect about the curriculum and about any of their capstone requirements, be it juries, recitals, student teaching, and licensure exams. They need to have all of the info up front so that they can make an informed decision, one, if it's the right major for them, and two, about how dedicated and how disciplined they need to be through this rigorous academic program. As you know, we have one of the hardest academic programs at any institution in the country. So we need to equip our students early to be successful. These exams and capstone requirements should become a regular topic of conversation during advising and mentoring sessions, especially sophomore and junior year. Collect and develop study materials and other resources related to your content area that are aligned to the content assessed on these exams. So pull out those supplemental materials in addition to your textbook. Pull out those, uh, those website resources, those YouTube resources. We're in a day and age now where our students get a lot of information from YouTube. So we need to utilize some of those same resources to kind of pull some things to help them prepare for these exams. So collect these things and offer these to our students as a, as a support. Um, as far as the 5113 exam, uh, the trends that I see, uh, we are struggling with music theory. So if you have um, if you have resources that can help them like with playlists that can help them hear chord progressions, there's a big struggle with chord progressions that include secondary dominance. They're um, having a hard time discerning whether it's five, six, five, or five, four, three, or five, four, two to five. They're, they're having a hard time hearing that and being able to select the correct answer. Um, having regular practice in your theory classes with error detection, whether it's a vocal or an instrumental part, being able to hear when an instrument is out of tune in a piece or being able to hear when an alto is singing the wrong pitch or the wrong rhythm. So if you could probably create some resources or some practice quizzes or some pop quizzes or a question of the day or a listening challenge of the day posted up at the elevator and the first student to get it right, I don't know, gets a chance to lead the class or something. Um, those are some ways that we can kind of improve on the theory area as far as gathering resources. Um, there's also a struggle with music history. Um, it's, the test is so broad. Uh, you can study Chopin all day and he'll never be on the test, but Clementi will be on the test or Philip Glass or Terry Riley or Bella Bartok. So it's very important that we um, possibly post composer facts up around our building or have a working glossary or have some flashcards or incorporate that into our recital sessions or our seminar hours. So students will have a regular practice with being able to put the composers in the correct era, knowing that the Renaissance period came before the Baroque and things like that are trends that I'm seeing with the 5113 exam. It's struggling with theory, struggling with music history. And of course, the technology component. Um, yes, Western music is not included. Um, uh, Non-Western music is not included on the, um, is, it, it's on the test, but we're not really covering it to the extent that it is um, covered on the test. So knowing that the balalaika is from Russia, knowing what um, the characteristics of the Gamelan Orchestra is, that's important for us to feed into our conversation and not just a blurb in our music history courses, they need to be actively engaged with what these instruments look like, what they sound like, um, in context, showing YouTube videos of people playing these instruments live, knowing what a bull roar is, you know, a didgeridoo. That's so important to understand the characteristics and knowing, you know, beyond percussion, a vocalist needs to know what the percussion accompaniment is for a bossa nova. That's so important because that's assessed on the test. Being familiar with being able to identify the soloist, knowing who Lionel Hampton is, and being able to identify that that vibraphone solo is him. Knowing who Gene Krupa is and being able to identify um, you know, soloists or snare drum solos such as his. So definitely um, that's something to include on the test. So again, with that, collect and develop study materials or make your own, but make it fun. Don't, you know, don't have it be just 
something else for the students to read, have bright colored posters around the building, or have a flashcard, a quiz of the day, or a scavenger hunt throughout the building, something that can tie in the content with engagement, because you don't ever want it to just be a boring regurgitation of information. You want to make sure that you're innovative and that you're able to engage the students of this era with, uh, with preparing for the exam. Also, encourage or facilitate study groups or boot camp sessions, whether it's a two day session or one week session, encourage that, encourage your stronger students to kind of set up peer sessions to kind of help those who are struggling in music history or music theory, or those who are struggling in their instrumental pedagogy class, you'll have a vocal major that can't get a sound out of the flute but they, they're not understanding that they need to know a working knowledge of the flute because they may ask you, what is the fingering for F on the exam? So we have to be able to, you know, kind of work and help each other out. Stay current on state and national changes to content and passing score requirements. Again, I'll send you some links so that you can always stay up to date. Um, the list of scores I'm gonna send you today may be different in three months because they consistently update um, the scores. So you wanna stay current on what the current passing score is for your state. For example, Mississippi years ago used to require 138 on the practice core, I mean, on the um, 5113. Now that score is 161. So it's very important to know what has changed and where. Collaborate with other professors within the department and across departments in the education, English, and math departments. Consider co-teaching. Consider having a professor that can come over and help your students strengthen their skills in math. I know this session is heavily geared towards a subject area assessments, but we still have students struggling with the math portion on the Praxis Core. But, you know, but encouraging teachers to come from other departments to work with our students or to co-teach with our students will offer additional support and opportunities for those students to be successful. Create opportunities for students to apply exam content in all classes and ensembles. We have to trust our product. I say this on almost every webinar I do. If we have music education majors, we have to allow them the opportunity to regularly practice and apply the skills and concepts we teach in the classroom. We cannot just wait until they are assigned to student teaching for them to actually get on the podium to warm up the band, for them to detect that the trumpet player is out of tune or that the flute player is consistently coming in a half a beat early. So we have to make sure that we allow opportunities for students to conduct to do mock lessons, whether they pull a student out who's struggling and okay, give them a five minute clarinet lesson or give them a five minute lesson on rhythm or sight reading or timbre. Um, allow our students to engage in orchestration and part writing and, and encourage that because the more they practice with that, the better they're gonna be with transposition questions. They're gonna be with error detection questions, part writing questions as well. And allow students to edit edit old scores that you have, edit transcripts or analyze transcripts that you've written yourself. So uh, create opportunities for students to always apply the content that they're gonna see on the exam. The more you can apply it, I use the term vocalize and memorize, but the more you can actively engage with the content, the more you're gonna master the content or the quicker you're going to master the content. Here are a few tips for students. If we have some students who are listening in on a call or on Facebook, meet with your advisor to create a study plan or an action plan for taking the licensure exam. So meeting with your advisor is not just to do your fall or spring schedule, and it's not just to make sure you're on track for graduation. You should take a proactive approach to meet with your advisor to say, hey, I'm thinking about taking the practice or the gaze here, here, here. What do you think about that? And how would you suggest I prepare for this? They'll look at your transcript. They'll look at your track record of your performance in your classes. And together, you both can make an educated decision as to when you should test to, to be successful. Keep all of your major course textbooks and materials. I know that's an outdated thing in today's society, but it's so important. I still have majority of my textbooks from freshman year over 20 years ago. And it's so important because I still have to use those materials. Keep graded assignments and assessments because where you got things wrong, don't just get that paper back with a C on it, look at everything you got wrong and go find the correct answer because you're going to need that information later for your exam. Don't just settle for, oh, I got a C and put it to the side. Go through and analyze your graded paper and make the corrections for your notes. 
Take your general education courses seriously, especially English, math, and general psychology courses. Again, all of that content that you're gauging there, while it may seem tedious and pointless, it does play a direct role into your um, program as a music education major. And then work with other music majors, form a study cohort, get together and study, have jam sessions or vibe sessions where you're just um, communicating content or quizzing each other back and forth. You're supporting each other. Get a cohort together where you make a pact with someone, say, okay, we're going to all test around this time. We're going to support you and help you study. And then we're going to celebrate you with, when you pass the exam. If you don't pass the exam, we're going to support you and we're going to see what we can do to help make sure that you pass it the next time you take it. So kind of work with other music majors to form that study cohort. Stick to your plan of study and sequence of courses suggested by your advisor. This is something I know that um, is a topic of discussion in music departments all across the country. You students should begin each semester with the intent to successfully complete each course you are enrolled in. And I highly encourage you to refrain from making changes to your schedule without consulting with your advisor. Just like we don't want to be blindsided about the praxis, your advisor doesn't want to be blindsided that you drop the course mid-semester without at least trying to work it out. Set aside a designated location to study free from distractions. Create a study calendar and stick with the calendar. Okay, we stick with the things we wanna stick with. You're gonna to have to have that self-discipline and self-motivation to stick with your study calendar. And allow yourself four to six weeks prior to your exam to adequately prepare. You wanna keep up and kind of refresh the information through and through all along your program, but at four to six weeks of dedicated studying prior to your exam to adequately prepare. One thing I also want to point out too, if you take the exam, because many of us are on a rush schedule because we're trying to graduate, we're trying to student teach, but if you get your exam scores back and you do not pass, do not immediately go the next day and register for the exam again. You need to take some time to go through your scores and see which areas were your challenge areas and which areas were your strengths and study those areas at least two additional weeks before you register for the exam again. And for my advisors out there, um, the wait time now is typically 28 days. So if a student needs to retest, they have to wait 28 days before they can register again. So just keep that in mind. Uh, students, again, create flashcards and vocalize to master and retain information. Incorporate exam content in your daily activities. Create a music playlist of classical, romantic music, world music. Uh, get reading material that matches the content on your exam. Go out and volunteer to give a mock lesson or demonstration, either to other people in your section, back at your high school, or just get a group of friends together and give a mock lesson and have critique you on that lesson. Do your research. Look at websites, books, periodicals, um, go to meetings, look at meeting attendance, score analysis, you name it. I, I definitely encourage you to go to meetings, whether it's collegiate NAFME, whether it's departmental um, student meetings, I encourage you to go to your recital hour because a lot of information shared can help you with the content on the exam. And then of course, practice, practice, practice. You're gonna have to practice questions, practice listening, practice analysis over and over again to make sure you have it under your belt. Okay, now comes the part for our interactive session. Uh, these are some things you could do now. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen periodically. And well, actually we can just use the chat box. So I'll give you a few things to look at. And I want you to jot down a few things that you can do now to help your students for this semester. Action planning assignment. I would like you to take a few moments and think about what you can do for your students this semester. Most of us are gearing up now to get ready to start for the spring semester, whether we start next week or whether we start at the end of January, or for those fortunate ones who don't start until the first week of February. I want you to think about what you can do as an advisor to help your students this semester prepare for the practice of the GACE exam. What are some things you can do? And I would say take a few moments and jot those down. Don't just think about them in your head. Why? Because if you jot it down and you see it on paper, then you will actually have that conversation with your student. So what are some things you can do as an advisor to help your students prepare for the practice this semester? As an applied instructor, what can you do when your students come in for their Woodland lesson? 
their percussion lesson? What can you do as an applied instructor for your education majors to prepare for the exam? What can you offer to students who are not your applied students? If you're an applied percussion instructor, what can you offer to the clarinet major who may be struggling with percussion studies? As an ensemble director, and I put this up there, I should have put this one in all caps. If we are a band, choral, orchestral director, jazz ensemble um, director, small ensemble director, it is our job to make sure our students are prepared for the practice. Yes, we have a lot of students in our program who are not music majors, that's true. But we have some students in our program who are music education majors. And the same time and dedication that they give us for our rehearsals and our performances, we need to give them that same time and dedication to make sure they're successful in their coursework and that they're successful prepared for their capstone requirements, be it their senior recital, student teaching, or the practice or GACE exams or any other licensure exam. So what can we do as an ensemble director differently this semester to show our students that we support them and that we're going to help make sure they succeed on these licensure exams? What can we do when we start rehearsal? How can we engage them more in our rehearsals other than them sitting in their seat ready to play or ready, or ready to sing? How can we engage them in our rehearsals or how can we demonstrate the conducting techniques, or how can we talk them through the process and give them a real world example to help them prepare for these exams? As a music history or theory professor, what can you do this semester differently to help prepare your students for the Praxis or GACE exam? If you're teaching woodwind methods, brass, strings, or percussion methods, you're taking, um, teaching vocal diction, vocal pedagogy, what are some things you can do for your instrumental and vocal majors to help them prepare for the practice this semester? I will tell you that um, things like, you know, breathing techniques and parts of the voice and understanding the resonator, those are, those are really stressful things for instrumental majors because we have no clue what that means if we've played clarinet or trumpet our entire career. We don't know what it means to, um, to have you know, diphthongs and things like that as we're talking about um, our work. We don't know what it means to lower the soft palate. So it's very important to have those conversations. What can we do as a music technology expert to help our students get ready for the practice or GACE exam? And I mentioned music technology expert because many of our institutions do not offer the technology courses but we have people in our department who are experts at orchestration, experts at Pro Tools, uh, Sound Pros, uh, Sound Forge, um, experts at streaming, experts at MIDI and editing, experts at sound engineering. How can we build upon that and utilize that expertise for our students, even if the class does not exist? And a lot of the times, some of our faculty and staff members may feel that if they're not full time, that um, they're not a part of you know, helping our students succeed or that they feel they don't have anything to contribute. That's not true. As an adjunct, assistant staff member, uh, grad assistant, if you have any of those, if you're on the call, what are some things you feel that they can do or that they can support with to help our students do better on these exams? How can we form a better um, a task force, so to say, to help our students um, increase their performance rate on these exams? As a department chair or a dean, how can we improve communications in our department amongst our faculty? What can we do to support our faculty um, as they learn more about these exams? And what can we do to support our students as they take these exams? And of course, you know, alumni, alumni, whether you have been successful or you've passed the exam, how can we pay it forward? How can we come and give back to our institutions um, in a way that we can help to ensure that more of our students experience what we have as certified educators? What can we do as alum of our institutions and of our music departments to help support those who are trying to achieve those same goals that we achieve? What can we do as, a, as an alum to support our departments and to support those students who are preparing for these capstone requirements? 
So it's a lot to think about, but I encourage you to definitely write it out as some things that you can do for change. It starts with just a little action and a little planning, and I guarantee it'll take off like wildfire. And I see definitely pedagogy classes. Um, there used to be some programs. There still are a few that offer summer programs on that like WARF certification and Kadai. But those programs are very, very expensive in some cases, and they're not always local. So knowing that, especially if we teach elementary methods, if we teach secondary methods, what are some things we can do to kind of simulate those experiences for our students so that it can still benefit from the content, even if they can't afford to attend the WARF certification workshop, the Dow Crows workshop. So what are some things that we can do to, um, to kind of support that um, if our students cannot afford to go elsewhere and get it? Yes, uh, textbook purchases has been a huge thing um, just with this generation in general. If it's not at the fingertips or not on that cell phone, it's been an ongoing challenge. So we have to think of some creative ways, um, whether or not, I don't know, maybe we encourage all of them, hey, get together with your group and you all purchase a book or get a group of four. You purchase this book, you purchase that book, and that is your cohort that you're assigned until you graduate. I'm, I'm just thinking outside the box that may not work in all situations, but it may be a start instead of just penalizing the student for not having materials. Maybe if we assign them to a cohort of people and that same cohort, they're following each other all the way through um, to commencement, then maybe they can kind of split the cost or split the burden of those books. Yes, definitely talking to students and getting them to um, understand the level of courses and the order that they should take courses. I think that's so important. Um, knowing the difference between a 100 level course, 200 level course, they see it in the book, but I just think sometimes we can't assume that our students automatically know what that means because in high school, it's just English 12. It's history, US government. It's not government 101-3L. You know, we have to take the time and while it seems tedious to us because we know it we actually we do have to have those conversations with our students you you'd be surprised it's better to over explain something to a student than just assume that they know yes they do um I highly encourage you to lean on the arms forces the president's own has some of the most phenomenal education programs out here they have broken it down to every instrument, oboe, bassoon, clarinet, and they're phenomenal. Some of the videos are half hour, some are a little over an hour. And with each one, they're going to give you a phenomenal live performance. So it's worth watching the video because you get to hear great music at the end. But I highly encourage you to tap into those resources. But also, when COVID passes, reach out to some of those performers and see if they will come and do a live demonstration or even in a situation like this, see if they'll zoom into your classroom and just you sit back for the day and let them teach your students for the day. Um, there are several military installations throughout the country, no matter whether they're at Camp Pendleton, whether they're in Quantico, they'll be willing to do these for your students because they need that mental break too. And being able to talk to a different audience gives them a refreshing take on their day-to-day -day activities. So I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, I know that the Kennedy Center is doing some huge things on jazz education. So that would be a great way to connect with, you know, concepts associated with Lionel Hampton, uh, Max Roach, Gene Krupa, uh, Benny Goodman, Sidney Bechet, all of those type of people. Uh, you can tap into the resources that we have. Um, reach out to those who are in charge of the Gen Conference. Um, I know the Gen Conference is going on this week in Texas, I believe. But after the conference, I would encourage you to reach out to them and see if they'd be willing to share some resources for your students. So definitely, um, definitely a good source of information. Um, I'm going to turn it over now for a question and answer session. So uh, we're at the end of our workshop. So if you have any questions, if you would utilize the raise your hand button and feel free to unmute yourself and share your questions. Um, if you're on Facebook and you're listening in and you have questions, please type your questions in the chat and I will repeat your question out loud for those who are also on Zoom.
And if you will, if everyone would place your email address into the chat, um, that way I can send you all of these materials after the call, you will receive an email tonight. Let's start with Professor Wright. How are you? Oh, good afternoon. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Dr. Brock, for uh, presenting this workshop. I think it's some very valuable information that we can pass on to our students. And um, my question is, uh, as far as other state tests, uh, do you know of any states that will recognize a state test that, uh, let's say for Alabama, we, we are on the praxis. If a student takes a test in Texas or Georgia and passes that test, uh, I guess, do states recognize other state tests or do we have to stick with Alabama? I guess that's something I would need to check with the state of Alabama on that, or if you have that answer. They do have, uh, they still do have reciprocity uh, for a lot of the states. For example, um, of course, I was certified in Virginia, but based on my Virginia scores from years ago, I was able to be certified here in Nevada as well. I was able to be certified in Washington State, South Carolina. So you do have reciprocity. The thing is, you have to fully pass all of your exams for your given state in order to have reciprocity. Sometimes it is easier, um, especially if you're fresh out of college. I know um, Georgia can be a little different sometimes as far as, you know, they still want people to take the case. However, if you apply for a license in your home state where you were um, certified, apply for a license there and then transfer your license, that's usually the easier way to get around some of the red tape or some of the hassle that you would get with the state of Georgia. Most of your other states will accept reciprocity fairly easy as long as you have all of your documentation, a degree from an accredited institution, you have completed student teaching and you have passed all of your certification assessments. Then you um, have the tools to be certified, you just pay your fee. Um, some of those fees are as little as $50 uh, to as much as $300. So uh, yes, yeah, some states require $300 or more for a licensure, Nevada being one of them. So um, it is interesting. So I paid a car payment to get licensed here, but um, it's you know definitely uh, worth it. And of course, once you pass these tests, everyone, uh, I get a lot of people to ask, do I have to retake these tests or recertify every year? No, once you've passed these tests, you've passed them for life. Even if the score requirements change later, you are automatically grandfathered in. So for example, for those who are fortunate enough to pass in Mississippi when the requirement was 139, they did not make them retest when that requirement jumped to 161. It was only for those who had not passed it that had to now meet the new requirement, which created a huge barrier in the state of Mississippi. Uh, Dr. Zelenek, I uh, saw your hand up earlier. Did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Um, first off, I'd like to applaud you for the work you're doing in this area. Um, I've had some students that have studied with you and gave me really positive uh, feedback. So here you go. Thank you. Um, so uh, my question was about uh, upcoming workshops or, you know, for students. Um, do you work on, a, on like a semester basis or um, how do you schedule your things? I work on an ongoing basis. So I can offer programs for um, those who would like to work within the semester. I offer summer programs. Um, I offer uh expedited programs as short as four weeks. Um, I try not to do anything less than four weeks because studies have shown with any standardized test, four to six weeks promote success on the exam. So I try to have something at least a minimum four weeks, but I can do up to 10 weeks. Um, boot camp sessions are just workshop sessions with those are usually one or two weeks long, but my full program, I do offer a variety of programs tailored to the needs of your institution and highly individualized. I have a couple of institutions I'll be starting with this semester and all of my materials, while you'll get the materials, it'll be personalized for your institution. So it'll have your institution's name on it. And all of my resources, when I send them to you, they become property of your institution. So you can continue to use them as long as you know, you, I'll give you a license for those materials. Um, so that's workbooks, practice tests, and everything else. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, Professor Graham. Okay, I had to do the, the <laughs> that's all right. Pardon yeah. me for that. No, I, that's okay. I, good evening. First of all, I am extremely excited. Um, 
uh, the see you doing this. When I saw it was out, I, I pushed the, the link out to my uh, department chair and some of the other faculty, um, our vice chancellor, academic affairs, and, um, and, and to the dean. And one of the things that, uh, and, and one other thing I was going to say, one of my students uh, who is out teaching right now, to, uh, I sent him a, the notice and he said, yeah, I'm already on with her. So you, you are reaching out down here and I think you probably already know who he is. And uh, he is, he's really uh, excited about it. He was getting disillusioned and ready to change out of his field. He's already um, doing a, trying to do a provisional and get through. One of the things I'm always afraid of and I get concerned is uh, what you talked about early on, which is making sure that our curriculum, uh, our syllabi reflects the uh, material. If they're, they're music, if they're gonna be music uh, ed, I'm teaching conducting. Back in the day when I was taking conducting, get in there, here's a score, get in front of the group and teach. And it's much more than that uh, in terms of, you know, correction, uh, management, understanding uh, what you're hearing. And so I just, I wanna make sure that, um, across the board um, in our department. If we got, we, I see Harold is on, Harold might be teaching um, um, uh, uh, band techniques. I'm teaching woodwind. It's not gonna hurt us to uh, overlap things in our, in our syllabi, which is going with, going back to what you're saying. And then the same thing in the theory class. And, and, and it's helpful that we are both teaching, we both taught theory. He's teaching some history or, or music of preach and making sure that we bring those things in and not just be waving our hands doing, um, just trying to get a concert on the stage and the, you know, what is the content, what is the matter? And in the student and, and in the, um, the uh, when we're doing our applied lessons, what I was saying, making sure that we've covered every style period. But if you got a student and you're doing applied lesson, there's no reason for them not to be familiar with the history and not just play a tune, but be able to break it down and say what it's about and then even help with uh, liner notes or some some background along those lines. Um, my question, follow up to that is, um, any uh, I consider myself still learning. Uh, I'm not in a position where I feel like I've got it. So I've already picked up some things here. I put my material out there. I'm looking to collaborate with any of your syllabi, what you're doing, you're conducting or your woodwind to see what you are actually attacking. And um, so that when the students finish the course of you, if you've adequately assessed them, they at least know that this is, you know, this is material that you have put in front of them, you've gone over and you've told them why they have to know it as well. So I put my information out there and I'll be, I'm definitely looking forward to collaborating with you. Indeed, and I, I encourage everyone on this call to reach across the aisle and collaborate. Um, we're in this together, you know, no matter where our institution is, large, small, liberal, performing arts, you name it, research-based, we're all facing the same struggles with our students, and the story is the same, whether you're on the East Coast, you're in the South, you're out here on the West Coast, our students are struggling in the same area with this practice, and it's important, I think, if we reach across the aisle and help and collaborate and share ideas, then we can be a better, a stronger force for our students to succeed. Because what may work in your studio may be the saving grace of what someone else needed in their studio. So I definitely agree with that. And of course, applied lessons, you know, um, having them go through the terminology, understanding that Andante is not vivo, understanding that, you know, um, you know, just how to shape expressions and what rubato really means and how to how to do that. A lot of our students are deficient in something simple as andante and allegro. Or there's like, what is that? And I'm like, are you serious? But is the nature of the beast. So definitely, um, Professor Graham, I um, thank you for that. And I encourage everyone on this call um, to kind of collaborate with each other and reach across the aisle and share those resources in the best interest of our students. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, Professor Fooster, good to see you. Dr. Brock, I, I wanted, uh, what, what I have wanted to ask you, because um, I haven't dealt with the, I have, years ago I took the practices, they, they allowed us to take the practices so we could see what they were putting on the exam. And that's probably been 10, 15 years ago. So I was wondering, has the question in it, how the questions are presented. And uh, I heard you just mention like terminology. I remember terminology being an issue also, but have 
the questions themselves or how they presented, have that changed recently? Yes, 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 and yes. So definitely, um, just some of the terminology is, is no, instead of directly you know, asking the question, there's a lot of padded questions as far as like, it's very lengthy questions. You're reading almost a word problem to answer the question. But we also have to understand some of our students may not understand certain inferences. And if we have students in our program that are also ELL or ESL learners, they may not understand what the word rote means. That rote means teaching it from memory or teaching it verbally as opposed to reading. Or they may not understand um, just some of the slang terminology or the other terminology for everyday words. So it's so important that you know we read those questions and we teach our students how to break down the context clues. Just something simple as um, which is not. Or, or which two, you know, understanding that they have to find two answers to that question, understanding uh, performance error. That means we're looking for a rhythmic error or a pitch error, you know? So yes, the, the way the questions are worded can trip a lot of our students up because of comprehension, which goes back to what I said about paying attention to English class and taking that core class of you know, correctly. Those grammar statements, having proper grammar, our students are so accustomed now to social media and talking the way they text and only having so many characters on Twitter mm -hmm. that it has condensed their comprehension skills when it comes to taking a question and breaking down the context clues in that question to understand this is a word I may not understand, but what is around this word that can help me take an educated guess as to what this term means? Like etwaslabab, I cannot pronounce that, but that is a German term for um, babachi, means lively. But what do we use in all of American band rooms? Babachi, you know. And so that's how broad and sometimes I'll say bogus the test has become because we're using things that our students would not practically use every day, but we have to teach them to expect the unexpected. So yeah, I would. Um, yes, the questions have changed, so we have to work on comprehension in our classes as well as teaching music. That goes back to the thing we say every day. We're more than just band directors and choir directors. We're everybody's teacher, mentor, English teachers, counselors. That's a, this is when this comes into play. Well, this is the next thing that brings me to the next question I wanted to ask you about your, the methods that you use. Now, recently I have been using case studies uh, mm -hmm. for my students and those case studies present issues just like you just mentioned some scenarios where they have to go find context clues to, to figure out this part of education. And then they have questions at the end that they have to answer what they have to really write out what they think and, and, and how to back up their thinking. So you just can't give an answer without having some backups to it. So I was wondering, have you been able to use that in the case studies in your recent um, with students? Yeah. Yes, case studies and scenarios are always great, and they provide excellent content for those who are studying for constructive response questions as well. But it helps them to think out, it helps them to think more critically about the questions they're reading. So case studies are um, positive um, areas of reinforcement for our students. So I would encourage you to create those scenarios for your students so they can talk through the problem instead of just giving a yes or no answer. If they can talk through the problem and use that terminology in their answers, they're going to they're gonna ace it when they see this content on the exam. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, this is Carlton again. I don't have a question, but uh, you, you gave me some, some great ideas to uh, in, in the section where you asked, how can we assist our students? And I, I just started brainstorming and just thinking about some things. Uh, for instance, I teach conducting like John does and what I'm going to do going forward is assign a section to play something wrong, whether it's a wrong rhythm or wrong notes or, or just pull out the slide, push in the slide and see if, make the students find the problem and correct it. Just sit back in the back of the room and you know just evaluate them that way. Rhythms, whatever the case is, I think that'd be a great idea to help the students in conducting when they have to listen to those things. Uh, I remember uh, having to do that when I went through national board certifications when I was teaching in Birmingham. So that, that's one way. And I want to thank you for uh, putting that thought in my mind. 
Indeed, but I even encourage you, make it fun. Tape a note on the student seat so that you don't know which students you've told to do something different on their music. Tape a note or an index card on the seat and say, I want you to play F sharp and measure 16. They're like, what? Just do it. And then have them, you know, identify, you know, the, uh, I think that'll be fun for the students. They'll look forward to it. It gets the non-music majors engaged too, because now you've created an entire conglomerate of people who are helping our music education majors succeed. They make it fun. And so now you you'll find, you'll step back and you'll see them quizzing each other down the hall or put the context clues down the hall. You know, our students will take anything and run with it. So I definitely encourage you to do that. Make it fun, you know, or, you know, we always have to be perfect in our applied lessons for our students. I don't know why we feel we have to show off. Sometimes I want you to go in and just have a bad day. You go in and just sing off key. Just go in and play a wrong note and have your students analyze what's going on. Because the more we humanize who we are, the more comfortable they're gonna feel as they as you go on this journey with them to, um, to success. So I encourage you to have an unconventional lesson. Just go in and bang at the piano one day and ask them what chord that was that you played. So definitely, um, I, I encourage that. So thank you, Professor Wright, for that. Any other questions? I know we are wrapping up the end of this uh while you're thinking for the final two uh, final couple of questions i'm going to share my screen one more time just to provide my contact information if you want to screenshot it i do have some uh workshops coming up i'm going to do one on curricular connections and relevant experiences redefining the role of the advisor and mentor um, so it's more than just padding the schedules for the next semester and transforming music education repaving the road from enrollment to commencement this is a presentation i'm presenting in march for the american association of blacks in higher education but i'm going to duplicate this presentation in april for anyone who wants to get this information as we take a collegial approach to the music degree program but here's my contact information if you would like to screenshot it or take a picture with your phone, feel free to reach out to me anytime uh, for supplemental materials or just uh, out of the box ideas as to how we can um, be innovative as we help our students, not just for the practice exam or the GACE, but also just helping them with general capstone requirements or helping them to be the best uh, future music educators and performers they can be. So even beyond music education, I'm on a track to make sure that we're holistic in all of our degree programs and that we're putting out the best students no matter what their background is. And we have a couple of more questions in the chat. Thank you so much for that. Test anxiety, the best way to assist a student who has knowledge but battles with anxiety. Um, I know I did a workshop a while back on performance anxiety and I did a couple of um, interviews, but test anxiety is a real thing. Um, you will have a student that will have an all out panic attack. Uh, one of the saving graces with COVID is that the 5114 exam offers students the option to test at home only because that test only offered a small testing window when it, when it first came out. I found that some people who had anxiety in public places did better when they tested at home uh, because they were in the comfort of their own surroundings. Even though they had to follow specific protocols, you couldn't have anything in your room. You had to have, you had to show your room with your camera and stuff like that, but they were able to take the pressure of driving to the test center and being around other people who were taking the test, it took that pressure off of them. The best way to combat test anxiety is to get students to regularly practice, regularly talk out the information, have them to feel comfortable talking to you about the content and engage in the everyday conversation. Because the second they stop feeling like it's a test, and they just take it as another assignment, it takes the pressure off. You, you can tell even in your everyday classes, when you say test or pop quiz, even the most prepared student feels some type of way about you for about two minutes because they don't wanna take a test. But if you take the pressure off of the word test uh, or assessment, it kind of curbs some of that anxiety. Also being prepared the night before the test, not, um, not cramming at the last minute, uh, not eating a heavy dinner the night before, making sure that everything you need for the test center is set out by your door, like your ID card, your keys, your wallet, things that you need. Set all that out the night before so that you can eliminate all that last minute hurry and worry. Make sure you get up at a respectable hour and put something on your stomach. Even if it's not a full meal, have something on your stomach before you go to the test center. Um, they used to say peppermint helps with concentration. I remember 
remember years ago, the state of Florida did those Senate pencils and they claimed that the peppermint Senate pencils had the students test higher on the test. That didn't last long, but it worked for the time being. Um, but anything you can think of to kind of get the student's comfort zone down, whether it's they have a favorite key ring or they wear a special outfit when they go take the test or they listen to uh, meditation music on the way to the testing center. Have them find what works for them, start collecting things that make them comfortable or calm and start building that into your classroom. Play music when they come into your classroom or on test day. You know, something, if, if they can practice getting their anxiety down and managing it and coping with it, then um, they'll do a little bit better in the actual test setting. Any final questions? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Thornton. I would like to say I, I've enjoyed everything that I've heard tonight. I am not a college professor yet. But that is one of my aspirations. But I am a um, K through twelve, well K through six in my case, elementary general music teacher. Um, I have served as cooperating teacher um, before to a, a neighboring college and university. Uh, my thing is, um, I heard a lot of band, um, you know, tactics and skills being offered tonight and suggestions, which were phenomenal. Um, however, a lot of our students, well, I want to say a lot, but some of the students may not choose or even get jobs landing high school um, choral or band um, positions, but some of them may get a general music position. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, an important facet of this conversation as well, how we could better prepare um, students to be successful general music educators, because that is the founding, um, the foundation and the building blocks to eventually becoming what we're all talking about here tonight, knowing what a Dante is, um, knowing what Allegro is, you know, all of those things, we plant those seeds early within those um, five, well, yeah, K through five or K through six, all those years that we have them, you know, in those grades. So um, that's, that's where my focus is. Um, and certain things that I've noticed with that um, from students that I've had, um, in student teaching is this scope and sequence. Um, they're not familiar, um, or even if they are, um, they have a hard time with making that connection of how do you teach a quarter note to a, kid, a first grade student or how would you teach the quarter rest and then on, you know, how would you do all those things in a fun way, you know, so. Exactly, and you can even utilize the ensemble setting to uh, strengthen those who have a desire to go into general music or may land a general music position. So in your choral um, programs, have those music education may just come up and take you through soul fetch, take you through your breathing exercises, take you through some of your, use a game, use a children's game, you know, to get everyone warmed up for rehearsal because we're never too old to have some fun with our warmups because we know skills and singing skills are boring. And we do, we do it the same way every day in every rehearsal, concert E flat, concert E flat. A, or someone goes to the piano and starts playing the five note pattern for our vocalist. So have our students change it up, utilizing those general education games. In the band setting, taking it back to long tones, quizzing that vocabulary, having someone play a whole note and a half note because you have college students today who are still skating by because they will not hold that dot a half note for three counts because no one ever told them to have three counts. They're just playing what they heard someone else beside them playing. When you cut off, I cut off. But we term it kissing a note. But I'm gonna leave that alone. That's a different conversation. But those are some things we need to, that we can, yes, we can utilize that for our general music majors or those going into general music. Bring those elementary techniques into our collegiate setting and show all of our majors that they are important. Because not you're right, not everyone wants to work with high school students or middle school students. They want to work with our babies. And it's important that we cultivate and give them those opportunities to practice as well. So yes, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, indeed. Well, thank you guys. If you have additional questions past today, feel free to email me or contact me. I will reach out to everyone tonight with the supplemental information. Thank you for lending me your evening, especially on a, on a Tuesday night, middle of the week. So I appreciate you. Stay tuned for upcoming workshops for me. And if you would like more information about my practice prep courses or uh, workshops or boot camps, I do do general workshops. I'll do a general workshop uh, free of charge for your students. 
students just to explain what's on the test and how to prepare. And then if you want a pilot program, more extensive program, um, I do have some plans available for that as well. So if you're interested, feel free to contact me and reach out. I can tailor it to meet your needs for your institution. And I also do faculty and administrator workshops as well. So thank you all again for your time. And I pray you all have a great evening and a very successful spring semester. Thank you for joining.